You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia, with me, Natasha Moriarty. The last week has seen demonstrators from around the world take to the streets to protest against Northern Ireland's controversial abortion laws. Here in London, more than 150 people gathered outside the Irish embassy, holding posters bearing slogans like, I am not a vessel, and this brutality makes me ashamed to be Irish. The protests were triggered by the case of a woman who had come to Northern Ireland from overseas. She was pregnant, having been raped in her home country. She was denied an abortion, despite saying that having to go through with the pregnancy would make her suicidal. After a hunger strike, she gave birth by caesarean 25 weeks after conception, and the baby was then given into state care. Protesters say that this case shows that the new legislation, Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, is unworkable. Joining me in the studio for a discussion today are Anne Rossiter, an Irish feminist activist living in London. Anne is author of Ireland's Hidden Diaspora, The Abortion Trail and the Making of a London Irish Underground. Anne is a member of the Direct Action Group, speaking of Imelda, which stands for Ireland Making England the Legal Destination for Abortion. Mara Clark is also here. She founded the Abortion Support Network, a London-based charity that raises money to help Irish women pay privately for abortions in England. And Mairead Enright, a lecturer in law at the University of Kent and a member of the Irish-based Lawyers for Choice. And over the phone, I'm joined by Cathy Doherty. She's spokesperson for the abortion rights campaign in Ireland, and she's speaking to us from Dublin. So I'll start by asking you, Mairead, please, why are people protesting at the moment? The current protests are about a recent case. It's a story of uh, a young woman, still in her teens, who came to Ireland, it, it appears now, seeking asylum. When people come to Ireland seeking asylum, they are housed in what we call direct provision. Direct provision has its own mass of um, difficulties, human rights difficulties. Within just two weeks of arriving in Ireland, uh, she had under- underwent a standard medical examination and it appears that that's when she first discovered that she was pregnant. Um, she was about eight weeks pregnant at that stage. She was pregnant because she had been raped in her country of origin. Immediately, it appears, upon discovering that she was pregnant, she said that she could not go through with the pregnancy, that she would kill herself. What happens next is not clear. There are conflicting reports in the media. But it appears that even though she had, she, she had spoken to, you know, she'd been medically examined and so on, that it, there was a very long delay between her discovering that she was pregnant and her being referred um, to somebody who could help her within the legislative scheme that we have for granting access to abortion within Ireland. So your, your uh, listeners may know that, um, you know, Irish women have abortions, right? One in ten Irish women has had an abortion but most Irish abortions take place here in in the UK and the reason for that is that Irish law um, provides that you may only have an abortion within uh, Ireland if there is a real and substantial risk to your life which can only be avoided by abortion which can only be avoided by terminating the pregnancy in that way. That law comes from a case called X which was decided by the Supreme Court about 20 years ago more But we only legislated for it in 2013. This is the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act. So there was a long delay between this woman discovering she was pregnant and her being referred for the process that that act establishes for determining whether you are entitled to an abortion. It is sort of Kafkaesque in its its complexity. At around uh, 20 weeks, a little over, she finally got to see a, a psychiatrist you have to see two psychiatrists and an obstetrician to be certified, let's say, for abortion within Ireland. The three of them met, as they are entitled to do under statute, and they determined that she met the test for an abortion, but that the better thing to do was to perform a C-section, which would enable a live birth. And so a child was born via C-section at about uh, 25 weeks. What I guess people in Ireland are, are protesting is we've discovered how this act can be implemented. This woman was not compelled to accept food, was not compelled legally to undergo C-section. The health service executive went to the High Court to obtain orders to that effect. It's just that she, she, she gave in, right, um, is, is, is the issue. But what Irish women have realised now is that our laws may, we don't quite know, may um, require women to be compelled to undergo sort of, you know, quite serious interventions to compel a live birth even where their pregnancy is at extreme, would pose an extreme risk to their, to their life and, and, and health. 
So I think those are the kind of major issues, the delay and what could happen to women in Ireland under this Act. OK, um, thank you. That was a, a very clear explanation. Do we know why there might have been that delay? Do you think that that was a deliberate delay? Well, I don't think it's related to efficiency. I think it's probably related to uh, uncertainty among the legal and the medical profession. I mean, the medical profession is coming out saying that it made the necessary uh, commitment. Is that not so? Uh, Then you have other people saying that they delayed because they weren't at all clear how far they could move. And everything conspires against a a woman being able to determine what she wants with her body. And so now we have, it is true that the C-section ultimately was consensual. But as Marait has said, I mean, you are, you're worn down. Mm -hmm. Uh, When she was told there was no other option. That's what I've understood. Mara. First of all, nobody knows exactly what happened in this particular Mm. case. Um, The woman in question, and we're we're calling her a woman, but she just turned 18, Mm. barely speaks English, if if at all, that's unclear, escaped a war-torn country as a refugee, you know, was violently raped as part of war, escaped to what she thought was safety, and look what's happened to her since. For me, the best uh, indication of what actually happened is this young woman did an interview with Kitty Holland Mm -hmm. from the Irish Times in which she said that she was told that at this point it's not an abortion. The only way to Mm -hmm. do it is by cesarean, Mm -hmm. which is medically not true. Mm -hmm. Um, But even so she she was lied to. Well, again, we don't know 100 percent because we weren't we weren't in the room. But the issue with with this case for for me is that nothing. The only thing to me that is surprising in this case is the cesarean. I would have been less surprised if they had restrained her and force fed her until she came to term, because every other bit of her circumstances, the fact that she was suicidal, the fact that she went on a hunger strike, so basically tried to take her own life, that because that was the only means available to her. Um, to to take her own life was to, to that that's what she was doing. She said, "I'm not going to eat or drink, so that I will die, so I don't have this baby." All of these issues are issues that we have heard from women in Ireland and Northern Ireland who seek abortions. And the other thing that we need to point up is that the woman could not travel without papers. She needs an exit visa. She needs a re-entry visa too the Republic. And this, of course, takes time. And this is not the first time that people have been, that women have been in this situation and have had to give birth because of the long process. The longer you delay, the longer the pregnancy goes on, the more expensive the the abortion ultimately is. Mm. And just to make clear, okay, because she's 18, living in direct provision, she would receive an allowance of 19 euros and 10 cents a week. She does not have any family in the country. How women are expected to come up with that money is anybody's guess. At the United Nations Human Rights Committee in July, the committee put the question to the representatives of the Irish government. If our regime relies on women being able to travel abroad to terminate pregnancies, what do we do about women who are in direct provision, women who are otherwise under the care of the state, women who are just poor, and a lot of women are poor in Ireland as a result of the economic mismanagement and collapse? What are you going to do? And the representative from the Department of Health sat there and said, we do not have a solution for these women. And she said, but, you know, nobody has sued over it. And that's a very key, that is a Mm. key point. The Irish government has spent so long bringing women through the High Court and the Supreme Court and the European Court of Human Rights that it seems to think it seems to think that it's acceptable to leave women in a position where the only way to vindicate their rights is to go to court. The European Court of Human Rights has told it in 2010 that that's not acceptable, that it needs to put procedures in place and so on. They're just, they're just living in a kind of a constitutional cloud cuckoo land where the only thing that matters is this fetishised decision to grant an abortion or not. They haven't thought about how women, you know, women's lives, they haven't thought about the social or economic or other barriers to actually sort of women's actual decision making. Yeah, there's this there's this idea that, you know, because we women are these Madonnas and we're motherly and all that stuff. They have this idea that if you make a woman have a baby, everything will be grand. Everything will be grand. Nothing will go wrong. And the fact of the matter is the number of women who've contacted us 
who, in order to get rid of a pregnancy, ingested chemicals, drunk bleach, drunk floor cleaner, got Cyrotec on the internet instead of getting actual early medical abortion pills or took early medical abortion pills later in the pregnancy, took them with bottles of vodka. We heard from a mother of four who very matter-of-factly said, I'm trying to figure out how to crash my car so it'll cause a miscarriage but not kill me. This is what boggles the mind, is what's the alternative? The alternative when you prevent women from having terminations is not that everyone lives happily ever after. I mean, we've had, we've had women and couples ration food for their children and for themselves to, you know, to raise funds for a termination. The cesarean section is what completely blows my mind. They cut this woman open. This young girl is going to have a scar. I spoke to a midwife yesterday, actually, about this, and she, the midwife indicated that because of the, the age of, of, of the girl or, or woman uh, and the type of procedure, that it was also highly unlikely that she'd be able to have a, a vaginal delivery again in the future. So, so not only does she have a scar for life, but also if she does decide to have children again in the future, it's going to have to be in a very specific way. What, what's the mood in, in Dublin at the moment, Cathy, with these protests? Are people very, are people very angry? Yeah, there, there really is enough, you know, no more false balance. We've heard it all. There's nothing left but to listen to a scream autonomy. We're reading the same headlines. We're campaigning to remove the same amendment. We've been doing it for 30 years. It feels like you're banging your head off a brick wall. The government hide behind the Eighth Amendment to our Constitution and say, because of this, we can go no further when it's within their power to call for a referendum to repeal it. And I know that ev everyone here has campaigned for the rights of women and you've all helped women who are struggling to have these terminations. Do you feel that there's a slight contradiction in the helping women you're almost doing the work that the government should be doing. And that could in turn mean that the government relies on people like you helping out and doesn't face the issues that they really need to. Cathy, would you like to start? Certainly, if it, if it wasn't for the proximity of the UK to Ireland, we would uh, probably have had much higher rates of, um, of deaths and pregnancy. I think because the UK is so close to us that our government have been able to avoid... Um, legislating for abortion in the country. But I, I, I don't think that that is able to continue. More and more women in Ireland are um, using organizations like Women on Web and inducing their own miscarriages in Ireland, which unfortunately is now subject to like 14 years of a sentence. So, so women and healthcare providers can face a 14-year prison sentence for for having an abortion in Ireland outside of the rigid parameters of the Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act. I suppose and, uh, those those tough penalties go some way to explaining the as as you said Kafka esque situation with medical practitioners because are they are they afraid that they might do something that could land them in jail? Unless a termination they will, will save a woman's life, she can't access one. Doctors can't intervene to to manage miscarriage. They can't intervene to to manage any number of of health conditions. Women women have had to delay cancer treatment in order to travel to the UK to have an abortion. To, to come back to Ireland to then get health care. OK, now you both shook your head when I asked if doctors were afraid. When all over the world doctors have intervened and take the Spanish case, huge numbers of doctors broke the law. They've come out and said, I helped or I was involved or I actually did an abortion, prosecute me. But the fact of the matter is that the underpinning ideology is very different in Spain. The Catholic Church is a different beast in Ireland. In Spain, the Catholic Church went to bed with Franco. It was part and parcel of the pillar of the fascist state, equally with Miss Mussolini in Italy. In Ireland, you had a situation where the Catholic Church was persecuted by the British first generations and was part and parcel of the movement for uh, ultimately for independence. So you have it's very similar to Poland, where the Catholic Church, for instance, plays that kind of role, a liberationist type of role historically. And in Ireland, we've got a culture which is embedded in people, regardless even of whether or not they're practising Catholics, regardless of not or not of whether they would consider themselves Catholic. We're at the beginning only of a process to liberate ourselves into something fairly what might conform in European terms to a secular state. Hitherto, we have been a theocracy. 
and the glorification of women as mothers is, you know, widespread in people's psyche. So those doctors, they don't, they don't want to help. There is an organisation called Doctors for Choice, mm -hmm. and I think Doctors for Choice have been a, a, a stalwart voice, and they, they need to be listened to. But yeah. they are a minority, a minority and we, I, nobody is saying that all of Ireland is of this mind. There is obviously a significant secular minority, but the political will isn't there. I mean, you're not getting demonstrations on the street of anything like the size that you're getting in Spain. You're not getting representations from ordinary doctors like you're getting in Spain. Cathy, could, could you tell us what the protests are like on the streets at the moment? We had a demonstration on Wednesday and uh, it was really, a, it was a great turnout, but it um, could obviously have been much bigger. There was about two, two and a half thousand people. Were there any members of the pro-life camp there? anti-choice we don't call them pro-life i had several several people shouting at me yesterday with a with an urgency that i haven't ever experienced myself before with such wildly different belief systems about this issue what's the atmosphere like in ireland i mean do people coexist peacefully on the streets but you, but they just don't speak about issues like this shame prevents women from talking about it so Those activists were... like you are very much in the minority activists are, are certainly in the minority. People in support of, of varying different levels of access. It's it's growing. People are changing their minds. The death of Savita Halepanava last October, my 84-year-old grandmother spoke to me about her rage and her disgust, and, and I had never imagined that I would have a conversation with her about choice ever. Mm. So, um, unfortunately, progress in Ireland marches over the bodies of dead women. Mara, would you like to...? A very good friend of mine who works in reproductive rights, she travels the world constantly, and she, there's a guidebook that she downloads, and the one about Ireland said, in Ireland, people are very, very friendly, just never bring up anything controversial, such as the troubles or abortion. So abortion is really a, a prime national issue. It's a prime but national issue and it is often uh, equated with the civil war in 1922 where we had partition of the island and a, a civil war followed because people were of conflicting views on it and it is cited as one of the big watersheds in modern Irish history mm -hmm. and frequently, not just this time but on other occasions, it has been mentioned that the uh, polarisation in Ireland is equivalent to the polarisation that there was over the civil war. I do think certainly people have strong and opposing views on the issue of abortion. I, I, I do think that's the case. But nobody, man or woman, in Ireland under the age of 50 has had the opportunity to vote for a more liberal abortion regime. I think the people, the generation who are about 10 years younger than me, who came to adulthood in a very different economic climate. People in their early 20s are doing fantastic activist work because the government has made the great mistake of leaving them with plenty of time to think and read. And I really do think that young women are thinking about this issue, that young women are frustrated about being held to a law that was passed before many of them were ever born. I think that, that, that the younger generation of Irish women, once they think about this issue, are going to are going to mobilize and perhaps not they, publicly but they will vote they, they will, will vote i don't disagree with any of that but they're mm. going to have to f face an entrenched political system sure. this is the problem mm. the political parties it's fine for us to be on the streets mm. intergenerational activities mm. i'm 70 and i'm still at it mm. uh, but the fact of the matter is we have political parties that are unwilling to move. Mara, did you want to say something? Well, I just, I wanted to say that I, I wasn't surprised that Cathy found a lot of aggression mm. on the streets in Dublin. When public opinion in favour of liberalising abortion laws is strong, that's when the violence starts happening. Mm. You know, in the States, that's what we found, you know, during the Clinton administration and during the Obama administration, there are many more attacks on clinics and providers. Just a separate thing when we talk about doctors and when we have these laws that um, make it okay, okay to have an abortion if your life is in danger, but then we focus so much on the criminalization um, if you step outside of those guidelines. The thing is, a woman whose life is at risk from a pregnancy, and then they give her the abortion, and then people say, oh, but she looks okay to me now. It's very easy for doctors to be prosecuted for, for, for having 
you know, under when you when that's when that's the benchmark, you know, how do you prove after you've saved somebody's life that their life was at risk? Women who who access abortion under under section nine, they they have to face a panel of two psychiatrists and then an obstetrician. Mm. So so all three of these have to unanimously sign off and agree that she uh, is, is suicidal and therefore can access abortion. And 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 if they don't unanimously agree and she wishes to pursue it, then she has to face another panel of another three doctors. And and given what's happened in this case, I would advise any suicidal woman in Ireland not to engage with mm-hmm. the Irish Health Service mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. order Just to order straight. pills from the internet mm-hmm. or travel if possible, contact an organisation like the ASN. I would not advise any woman to, to take that on. And I just want to go to you. You've obviously been campaigning for this for years and years. What, what triggered your interest in it in the beginning? Well, I had a backstreet abortion, a very botched one here in London that I've before the arrival of the 67 Act. Uh, So in the early 60s, I had a backstreet abortion here and um, I nearly died. Uh, And it wasn't just having to go back to the abortionist three times for it to work finally. It was also the fact that I was treated very badly when I got admitted as someone on the cusp of life and death uh, to St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Uh, when I arrived, there was a young doctor at a and and he was much more concerned about finding out who the abortionist was than he was in somehow or another alleviating my pain. And of course, the police were called. Again, they weren't interested in finding out uh, about me, they were interested in the abortionist because so that was the, so I got women so... Women really aren't the priority. No, now. I got no. so, not about that. You can't think, I mean, essentially I ended up on a ward with elderly women with gynecological problems who uh, took issue with my screaming and shouting all night when I was prematurely giving, I suppose, uh, birth to a dead fetus. And they had been told And so I ended up eating bits of the linen, the bed linen. And I remember all that, you know, okay, people suffer much more in look at Gaza, look at wherever. I'm not trying to say this was extraordinary, but it imprinted itself on my life to such a degree. I didn't blame myself, probably because I'm too bloody arrogant or something like that. I don't know. I was always an awkward cuss. But the fact of the matter is, I never want to see women reduced to this kind of stuff. And have you heard stories of women who have been in similar situations? All the time. I mean, come on, London is full of them. Mm. And I I meet them in Ireland as well. We have victims of the Magdalene laundries, victims of punitive institutions, women who had babies outside. Ireland is full of this kind of stuff. Mm. And London, they are decanted to London. It's like coming for an abortion. This is the sort of safety valve we've got. It does seem as if England has allowed a massive lack of realism to continue, really, in, with, within the Irish government. Well, uh, first of all, there's women who call us from Ireland who are pregnant and are like, oh, but I thought because I was raped that I could have an abortion. Oh, but... I have a fatal fetal anomaly. The baby has Edwards syndrome. It won't live. It won't live. Surely I can have an abortion. No, you can't. You can't have an abortion. You can't have an abortion unless you can prove that having the baby will make you die. So there's a there's a lack of education as well. Ah, education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but That's a but funny one. <laughs> but it's also what it is, is it's about economy because people think, oh, well, if you get pregnant, you can just go to London. Oh, you can just go to London. Okay, let's let's think about that comment right there. It smacks of what we like to call privilege, mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, you know, basically being able to travel to England means that you have travel documents. Mm. You have to have access to the internet, and I'm sorry not everyone does. You have to be able to book tickets. You have to be able to take time off work if you have a job. You have to be able to explain why you're gone for 19 hours. And also, have you ever been to Ireland? No offense, beautiful country, but unless you live in Dublin, it is impossible to get in or out of that country. Kathy? Even just with regards to, to you know, 
uh, I'm sure I'm sure there are like anti-choice, anti-abortion doctors in uh, the city too. But with regard access for 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 women who are suicidal, it's sort of a lottery as to as to what sort of doctor you're going to get. Will he be anti-choice? Will he uh, hinder your trying to access? That, that's an interesting point, Maraid. There is what we would call a conscience clause. The conscience clause exists to ensure that doctors who have a conscientious objection, it doesn't, of course, have to be a religious conscientious objection under the Act, which is a problem, but that they could refuse to participate directly in the termination of a pregnancy. And they have an obligation to refer. You know, obligations to refer are, are difficult. There is no sanction for refusing to refer. You're assuming that a woman would have the confidence and be in the position to mm. report the doctor yeah. who did not refer her. In Italy, for example, this was, has been very widely reported, conscientious objection of that kind got out of hand to the extent where there are whole areas mm. of Italy where you cannot, you absolutely cannot get access. I think I think I read at one point that in Sicily it was particularly, particularly difficult. The other thing I was, I was just going to say, women in Ireland are brought up in this culture of, of just respectability which is you don't talk about sex, you're not educated about sex, and you don't, you know, and if anything goes wrong, you know, there's still, there is still stigma around motherhood outside, outside marriage in Ireland. What's going to be really difficult here is that this woman um, was in direct provision, and the vilification of asylum seekers in Ireland by the state cannot be overestimated. Um, there is a real race politics um, going on here. Look at the cases we have. The cases that went to the High Court, they're about young women in care, they're about a young traveller woman, they're about women in the asylum system. It's the women on the edges who suffer and unless we can bring, you know, we have to keep a, a laser focus on that issue of marginalisation while also arguing about the broader um, implications of, of the abortion law. And it is also worth noting that it was an Indian woman who died. Who died yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, her pleas were not heard that I am not a Catholic, I'm a Hindu. If you are new to the country and you would never guess that this idiosyncratic arrangement was the law, why would you ever guess? As Mara says, Irish women are surprised and shocked all the time mm. at the limitations of the of the abortion law. So it is significant that the women who are who are showing up at the edges of this law are you know are not are not Irish by birth. I also find I f- find your point about the glorification of women as mothers really interesting. Is there any pressure at all on men to be idealised fathers? <laughs> or like, what, what, what do the men think of all of this? <laughs> Where do they... <laughs> Cathy, do you want to... I mean, I can hear uproarious laughter from all quarters. What, what would you say to that? There's not the same obligation on them. Uh, and, and, and that's not just with Ireland. That's across the world. At, at the end of the day, these laws don't affect men unless through a woman in their lives. Mm. Socially, like, men aren't compelled to stay to stay with women that are, that are pregnant. Mara, you go on. Abortion Support Network doesn't hear from most women who need abortions because most women who need abortions have a credit card and support somebody in their life they can reach out to um, and income and things like that. We hear from the women who are on the fringes to begin with. Because if you're not on the fringes, then you don't have to talk, call a group of strangers in another country and ask for money uh, and involve them in your abortion decision. Having said that, we've heard from, we, we just hit 1,500 women um, Wednesday, actually, the day the rallies were. And the number of times we hear from women, well, I, t- I, I told my partner, he said he wanted nothing to do with it. He spat in my face. He walked out the door, but he said if I was after having the abortion, he'd paint murderer on my house. Um, the number, you know, the number, and again, there are other issues going on in these women's lives. A lot of them are in or escaping abusive relationships. A lot, I mean, they're all poor. Every woman who contacts us is poor. That goes without saying. Mm. Um, so there's other, you know, economic and social issues going on. But yeah, we hear from a lot. But then again, there's a lot of women who do have the men in their life who who know. And, um, you know, one of the, for, for me, and I don't, I don't think that there are good abortions and bad abortions. I don't think that any abortion is more deserving um, or anything. But one of the things that I, I can't highlight enough are the couples who have desperately wanted pregnancies and find out that they have fatal fetal anomalies. And usually when we deal with people on the phone and assess financial need, we almost always speak to the woman involved just to make sure she's not being coerced. In these cases, it's, we very often speak to the man involved. We can hear the woman sobbing you know, because of the grief that they have to overcome as well as being forced to leave their country to go and to go and have a medical procedure. Um, the fact that Ireland turns its back on people in vulnerable position, positions, so whether couples with wanted pregnancies that are ending 
um, young immigrants, women pregnant as a result of rape. You know, Ireland is turning its back on these women. To some extent, the government does provide, um, you know, insofar as it allows uh, organisations like the Irish Family Planning Association to provide, let's say, pre non-directive, very limited, heavily legally restricted pre-abortion counselling. And doctors um, know and their, their, their regulatory body tells them that they have an ethical obligation to provide post-abortion care if a woman presents to them, though of course stigma means that, that, that women won't. The government issues visas, very rarely, but issues visas to women in direct provision, exit and re-entry. And we know that the government also indirectly, when, when um, women, young women, teenagers in the care of the state require abortion, that the government enables them to travel to England and funding, and this has just been reported, we've known this for years, but this has just been reported, finally admitted by the Department of Justice and the Irish Independent today. When you think about the complexity of all of those webs, the kind of do it, facilitate it, but let's not say it in public, when you contrast those regulatory practices with the ridiculous public rhetoric of abortion and the ridiculous con constitutional conception of you know the unborn, which by the way isn't even defined in Irish law for most practical purposes, there is, um, there is a tremendous, tremendous hypocrisy and a tremendous, tremendous double think going on. The other thing I was going to say about Irish masculinity, um, <laughs> you know, I think it would be, it would be you know, I, I think a lot of men in, historically have been active in the reproductive rights movement in Ireland. I'm thinking of, you know, men like Michael Solomons and Frank Crummy and people like that. Um, who have you know realised what the law was doing to women and who have who have who have acted and these are men who have acted outside the scope of their own private relationships and have been public advocates um, for reproductive health, but I think you have to look at our parliament which is still largely male dominated and I think you have to look at our judiciary which is in still male dominated even though we have a, a female chief justice now, and the public rhetoric of abortion is so completely out of touch with the practicalities. That's our problem, that we, we insist on having these abstract, old-fashioned moral debates. And insofar as possible, we keep what actually happens out of the public sphere. So we need some kind of new honesty in our in So our when you debate. say what actually happens, what mm. do you mean? What What's being left out that you think needs to be said? OK, what's being left out? That, OK, oh, lots of things. Um, how, Just, how do doctors, how will doctors actually approach a woman whose life is at risk? OK, so we have some scraps now from, let's say, the inquest into Svita Halepanavra's death and the inquiry into her death. But we didn't know. We didn't know until that woman died what how how the how the constitution would be would, would be applied. And the information took some time to filter it took, through. It through. Did, and it we filtered did. through piece by piece by piece. The HSE is holding an inquiry into this case, but that inquiry will be partial and will not cover the issue of why the Caesarean was performed, for instance, which is the constitutional issue, right? Doctors for Choice have asked for an independent inquiry. There is just there is just a concealment of in, okay, not just how doctors behave or how social workers behave and so on. There's a concealment okay, OK, let me put it another way. Doctors employed by the state in state hospitals, social workers employed by the HSE, which is an organ of the state. state. The state needs to come clean about every place where its thumbprints are over are over uh, women's abortion experience. That means the immigration system, the childcare system, the health, the health service executive, and medical practice. And we're leaving out the political system. But but the political and that's that's but that's my point is that mm. is that we we are working on the basis of abstract notions of what abortion means. We need to have we need the government to come clean about what it has been doing in relation to abortion in the last thirty years. So, yeah. The political okay. system needs examining very seriously mm. and when people come to vote mm. and you talk about a young generation coming through that mm. has a sense of entitlement, mm. a sense of itself mm. that except for the elite in Ireland up until now people generally didn't mm. have, yeah. uh, that that's developed and that many of them have secular tendencies at least uh, if not, some may still be believers, but they believe in perhaps in more secularisation, uh, permeating various elements of Irish society. But I would argue until we seriously look at the constitution of the political parties, it would appear to me that Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael and the Labour Party are not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, that they are not receiving um, great uh, catalysts to consider change. 
are they, for instance, interested in promoting women's rights? My answer would have to be that, no, I don't live there, but I'm there regularly and I read the Irish papers on a daily basis and I don't see much sound of it or sight of it at all. That they are relatively untouched by any of this and they're all on holiday at the moment, by the way. Cathy, do you feel hopeful about, about progress that can be made? Do I you do. Think- I do. I, I, I meet um, men and women every day who, who want to campaign to, to see the, the removal of, of the Eighth Amendment. There's definitely an appetite to repeal it, and I think that it's inevitable, and I think it's going to happen soon. That was Cathy Doherty, and also joining me in the studio were Anne Rossiter, Mara Clark and Mairead Enright. I'm Natasha Moriarty, and you're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia. Thank you for listening.